All right, it looks like we have a lot of people joining us. We're really excited. Okay. All right, so we will kick off today. Um, I'm Hillary Settle. I am going to be your host for today. Um, I want you all to be um, you know, very interactive with the, the webinar today. We'll have a section for Q and A's throughout it, um, but wanted to wel welcome you to um, shit every operations leader needs to know. We have some awesome thought leaders that are gonna be joining us today. We have Brad Smith, who is the CEO and co-founder of Sonar. And then we have Lorena Morales, who is the VP of Marketing over at Go Nimbly. So before we kick off, wanted a few to share a few housekeeping items. First, um, we will have two polls that will be prompting you to be interactive throughout the webinar. So those will be coming soon. Um, second, we will be recording this webinar. So afterwards, we will have an email that you can actually send out to your um, coworkers, team members that maybe didn't get to join. And then third, um, like I shared, definitely be um, adding Q&As like throughout the webinar, but at the end, we'll have Lorena and Brad address any questions that come your way. So I want to um, flip it over to Brad, who will get us kicked off. Fantastic, thank you, Hillary. Uh, obviously excited to be here and catching up with, uh, with Lorena and talking all things operations and shit that everyone needs to know as they go and lead their operations team. So uh, a quick background on myself, um, as Hillary mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sonar. Uh, we're a change management platform designed to make things easier for operations teams. Uh, our goal is to revolutionize the way go-to-market operations teams leverage their software. Uh, aside from that, I also started a, a very fun uh, Slack community called Wizard of Ops. I know we have a lot of folks uh, from that community on this webinar that we're excited about. So, um, yeah, excited to talk all things operations. You know, prior to starting Sonar, I did run uh, revenue operations over at Terminus, and even prior to that, running DevOps over at uh, at Gather. So, uh, we have a lot to talk about, but uh, nobody better to do it with than uh, Lorena Morales. Lorena. Thank you, uh, Brad. It's been such an honor to be sharing the the mic today with you because I, I think the way you share stories and everything got me really excited since day one. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I am Lorena Morales, the current VP of Marketing at GoNimbly, which is the RevOps company. Um, consulting, of course, mainly on revenue operations with clients like Sandisk, PagerDuty, Coursera, um, all the big and fun SaaS and PaaS companies here in the US and some clients in internationally. Before that, I've been growing marketing teams for over seven years now. Um, I have a little background in design, actually a lot of background in design. I live and breathe by design. And I think that's what kind of has helped me um, excel at this role and understand really what is revenue operations and to be able to execute that for our clients. What it means is that we just sit in the operations teams of our clients making um, their customer's journey uh, a gapless experience, pretty much. Love it, well, I know we're, uh, we're excited. So yeah, we'll just dive right in, Lorena. I know one of the biggest things that you and I talk about often when we're catching up and you know, even when our teams are working together you know, what does this shit even mean? What does revenue operations mean? Is it a buzzword? Is it something that's truly taking traction? But um, I know more than anything, you and your team know this firsthand. You're supporting all of these you know, very large enterprise clients that you were talking about. Um, so I won't take the thunder. I'll let you kind of take us away for exactly what revenue operations is. Simply because I breathe this shit. So as you see, people, we are cursing a lot simply because that's the theme of this um, webinar and you should be comfortable doing that. Um, what it means, that's a great question. For us at GoNimbly, it simply means that it, I mean, this, you, you can write it, but uh, at a higher level, it means that every single person in your operations team and the GTM team should be looking at the same um, metric, which is revenue. And that should be your North Star. The ultimate purpose, of course, is to bring, as I was telling before, a more gapless customer experience because that, that should be the focus of every single company, your customer. The days where product companies uh, were leading 
the, the, the revenue table are, are, are gone. You shouldn't be driving based on product. You should be driving based on customers. So that's why revenue operations, it's crucial to this model. So we're going to talk a little bit more about like the, the pieces of, of exactly what is this, but that is a definition at a very high level. Absolutely. And, and you nailed it. When we think of the topic for this today, it's going to be methodology. And the one thing that I know I get asked all the time, Brad, you've seen so much go-to-market technology. What system should we use? Should we be using this first and that? Should we be you know, leveraging five go-to-market uh, pieces of technology or 10? Not the topic for today. We are going to stick very strictly to methodology. Why is this important? We're going to be talking so much about the why, not exactly Yes, you should be using this marketing automation platform versus this sales engagement tool versus this customer success platform. So uh, if I busted anybody's bubble today that you're hoping to uh, get a couple of nuggets of which technologies are really going to move the needle for your company, happy to take that offline, but not exactly where we're going to go today. We're going to just dive so far into the methodology of what we're really looking to, uh, to solve for. So. I you, think won't see the, you won't see the, the marketing ops slide either, just FYI. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So uh, I think going into this, uh, we have a poll, correct, Hillary? Yep. So I'm going to prompt this poll for everyone. Let's see. And give everyone about um, 15 to 30 seconds to go ahead and fill it out. The main reason, people, why we want to uh, take a pulse on your mood is because, as you said, as, as you've seen, we are cursing. We want to we wanna set a good experience for this audience. And the way I also uh, like to, to see this is uh, how, like, if you can see your day in a color, uh, what would it be? Uh, so that would be great, ready for the weekend. Or it could be better. All of us have days when we say, like, eh, you know what? I could be doing better. It could be Friday. Yes, absolutely. So go ahead and, and answer, and we're going to share the. Um, there you are. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I couldn't agree more. Ready for the weekend. I know we still have one more day to get through, but uh, I think that's a resounding poll audience of uh, ready to get through that. Um, looking at some of these results, I find it so interesting. You know, how would, you, how would we rate our current change management strategy? I think the unique part of GoNimbly and Sonar both working together, obviously one being a software solution, one being a services solution, but the reality is we're both driving change management through our customers. And this actually is oddly music to our ears to hear good, but needs work. I think every company from a, a change management strategy perspective uh, has that mentality. Um, and I think, you know, as we continue through the webinar, you'll see more of this, you know, what do you consider one of the top challenges right now? Um, I love the diversity of these answers because really it seems like everyone is going through a couple of these different uh, strategy changes where we're either keeping teams aligned, uh, data integrity and management is so important right now, probably now more than ever, uh, navigating change and tech stack management. So uh, great to see sort of the diversity there, but also great to hear that uh, everybody's looking forward to the weekend. So. I think uh, one thing as we look at titles in this world, uh, you know, I've never been the biggest fan of titles. Um, you know, one thing that we all know to be true, depending on the size of your company, depending on what vertical you're in, some of these titles might have different meanings. But at the end of the day, I think from a methodology of RevOps titles, don't really mean shit. And here's why. Uh, when we start to really dive into uh, the skills that are involved with, with revenue operations, uh, I think that we find that uh, the market right now truly is still kind of figuring out some of what these titles are supposed to be. Um, you know, I, I tell folks all the time, you've seen this in a, a surge in the market over the last, you know, I think LinkedIn put a stat out over the last five years that uh, revenue operations by title has surged by more than 400% year over year. And that's to no surprise. We see so many people uh, with this new title. And I think what we're really trying to find here is what does it mean? And, you know, really, why does it actually matter? So with that, um, Brad, do you mind talking to us about these skills of the revenue operations teams? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when we look at the skills that are involved with this, um, you know, myself firsthand running these, you know, RevOps teams, either from an individual contributor standpoint or from a leadership perspective, 
Uh, I think one of those unique things that we've seen as this evolves uh, year over year is you know, five years ago, I think a lot of companies were looking for someone, some one to run RevOps. You were seeing just a single person to do this. And I think as we've all sort of peeled back these layers of the onion, what we find is there's skills that are in here that truly are uh, dedicated to multiple people. Uh, and you see this right here where you think of the strategy side of things. When we're taking this 10,000 foot view of, all right, what's the strategy we're trying to employ for our company, for uh, you know, making sure that our customers are raving about us. These are all very strategic moves, 10,000 foot, how do we drive growth? How do we drive adoption, retention, et cetera? That's a, literally a totally different skill than what we look at at a, you know, I call it a one foot view or a centimeter view or an inch view of how these tools actually interact with all that. Uh, big passion point for myself, running these, these very complex tech stacks. How do we operationalize around the, the tooling that we have here? Um, again, that drastically differs, but is also driven into the insights that we take away from all this data. Uh, we look at how insightful all of these great systems that we leverage, you know, Salesforce being one of those pieces in the epicenter of that, and uh, you know, all of the other go-to-market technologies. These are all big insight pools for us to understand what our data is telling us, how should we make decisions on that. Um, so while it's still very similar to the tool side of it, there's a lot more data and analytics and business intelligence driven to that. And then lastly, how do we put all this together, strategy, tools, and data and insights, and enable our teams? Uh, I think what we've realized just now year over year is why we're building these programs out and we don't see just a RevOps person anymore. We're now seeing RevOps teams that have these different functions and different you know, internal components to drive the success uh, you know, for their organization. Absolutely. The only thing I, I have to, to add to that is how you, um, or I want to talk about like experience and how GoNimbly makes sure that that we measure these, these skills in every single one of our team members. And uh, it's actually a funny way. We have something called Camp Nimbly, which happens once every year. This year, of course, it was digital. Yes, I am so sorry because, of, because we spend really nice moments at the pool. But anyways, that's another story. The, the important <laughs> thing is that we, um, every year, we, we make all of our consultants and our management team um, measure themselves against these four skills. Uh, ideally, you want your members to dominate at least two out, out of these four skills. I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in deep about this, but uh, it's something that I really wanted to add here. Absolutely. And probably myself or anybody is very much looking forward to uh, the Camp Nibley 2021 or beyond whenever we're back on track with it, especially in person. So, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so here's the thing. People keep asking, especially coming from, from a consultancy, hey, how on earth do I structure my people? Who I put where? Who, who owns what? Who reports to who? People, it shouldn't be that complicated. The main thing is you need to have a unified team. So let's define, first of all, who is your RevOps team and who is your revenue team? Two different things that tend to be confused. Your, revenue, your, Rev, your RevOps team is marketing ops, sales ops, and customer success ops, if it exists. Nowadays, we're starting to see more and more uh, that function, and not only seeing it in, 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 the, in the table, but being more strategic which for me is, is an absolute game changer uh, for the customer because that only means that customer experience gets to get in earlier in the, in the buyer journey. Um, your revenue team, it's that RevOps team that you have defined plus your, your GTM team. So sales, marketing, um, of course, and then both of them should come together and that should be your revenue team, the one that should be looking at revenue. Yes, as you guessed. Um, as, as Brad said, who do they report to? Eey, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Ideally, <laughs> yes, I wanna say the word to a CRO, but as Brad was saying, the title doesn't really matter. What you need to be looking for is someone who drives the business holistically that has that capacity of, of, of thinking, um, 
that can um, allow your team to, 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 to go towards those revenue goals and someone, very, very important here, take notes, someone that knows how to break the silos because silos is one main um, component of, of the entire revenue operations structure since it's one of the causes um, why your teams are not functioning very, very well. Um, so yes, that's kind of the basic structure. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you nailed it on the, the who behind that, of who's managing, who's running it. I think anecdotally speaking, from my own experience, it's been everywhere. Um, I can go even to my most recent two roles. You know, when I started even at Gather, I was kind of reporting under sales, but within the first six months, I transitioned under to the CEO. That same transition happened to me when I was over at Terminus. I started under the CRO and I actually ended up moving over to the CFO. And I think one thing to keep in mind here, which is why we say don't focus too, too heavily on if it's you know, the CRO side or the CMO or the CEO side, find where the strategy is that fits for your team and who's truly driving that growth and that revenue. So spot on. Cool. And then really, how do we make sure your team knows their shit? That's a tough question. And I think, you know, when we try to index that or really try to answer in on that, I think it's really, you hone in on how to find your skill gaps. Um, and I think what we're all realizing is what might be working for a company today might not work tomorrow, might not work the next six months, might not work the next year. I think that's one of the coolest parts about how we see our customers and Lorena, y'all's customers as well, evolve. Um, these teams start with maybe one person or two people. And you sort of realize how do you find some of these skill gaps that are going into that. But I think that's one of the biggest things is you make sure that, you know, if you hopefully you know your shit and if you don't fill some of those gaps in along the way. So yeah, and, go ahead, uh, on, on, on that topic, I think the main thing is to, to, to enable your team to, to don't believe themselves in forming many silos because that's only gonna generate a, a huge team of specialists. Um, again, I, I don't wanna say like, wait for, 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 for the good things to come, but I wanna talk uh, about generalists against the specialists because it's something that we truly believe at Gonimbly, not only we believe it, it's ingrained in our culture. Um, so I think assessing that baseline uh, at a company level, at a team level, at an, at an, an individual level, it's kind of the first thing that you need to do, and that's why it's it's first in this slide, um, and be able to to identify trends in your pipeline. Be super vigilant about that pipeline al along with your sales team. It's not all, it's not only about seeing trends, but it's also about taking care of making those things um, a process and part of your culture. Um, and uh, Brad, what about the next two? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think uh, assessing and understanding where your, your internal revenue strengths are, your red ops strengths are, where some of the gaps might fall is going to help so many customers and so many uh, groups mobilize around how to fill some of those gaps. But I think, you know, to zoom out and, and still stay at the, the reason why we have these groups defined is to support our go-to-market teams. And if we, to Lorena, to your point, and this is why I love so much about the, uh, you know, the Go Nimbly philosophy of breaking these, sil these silos down, if we continue to operate in these silos, all we're going to do is continue to drive disparity and, and lack of alignment across revenue, pipeline, like you mentioned, uh, and any other metrics that we're tracking. So if we have this unified voice and unified team, that's really going to make sure that we know what our goals are. We're all tracking to them in the same way. We're marching to the beat of the same drum. It just, it just goes so far. So one thing that you know, we'll drill in here now, and, and we talk about some of these, uh, these gaps, identify these gaps. Well, let's, let's double click into that and really find out what that means. Um, there could be people gaps, there could be system gaps, but when we think about how these processes uh, evolve and the communication that's in charge of them, um, you know, your sales, marketing, revenue, and customer success teams should be working together, not separately. I think what we find so often um, I think we've, we've all been in one of these scenarios before. We, we call it the, the dreaded boardroom uh, story where uh, if you don't have this alignment from the people gap side of things, you, 
you start, you know, let's review last quarter. Let's see how we did. And then your marketing person starts because they're at the top of the funnel. They're like, last, last quarter was great. We generated 5 million in new pipeline. And, you know, we're celebrating that high fives around. You pass that over to the, the sales leader. And, and she says, that's funny. I didn't see 5 million come in. I only saw 4 million in new pipeline come in, but, but that's okay. Cause we closed 2 million of that. And we're excited about it. And then all of a sudden, you looked out at the CS team, they're like, I didn't see 2 million come through. I saw a million get closed, but that's okay because our gross retention is 80%. We're great. And all of a sudden, you looked out at the other executives and they all have their hands in their head. And they're just like, why aren't we aligned on that? So we, we talk about how these people gaps really occur. That's what we talk about. And of course, segue, uh, segue into that, what we really look at from a system gap perspective, um, as well as these skill gaps, is, is really making sure that we document this stuff properly. You know, how do we make sure that um, we're not only setting ourselves up for understanding what today looks like, but if we document it the right way, we know how we're truly going to make sure that next week it looks right, how the week after that looks right, the year after that, uh, and everything else. So the way that we look at those, those gaps and how do we analyze those, build those, you know, we use some of the, the technology at, at our disposal um, and really make sure that we utilize them to our fullest, make sure that our teams know why we're making these changes. You know, all right, I know uh, you and the Go Nimbly team personally, because I've worked with y'all from a, a consulting capacity, y'all are just so keen on the documentation side and making sure that uh, that is totally evolved for your customer. We are, and, uh, and I say we, because now I am part of that documentation culture, uh, because again, every single process that has been proven to be successful at Go Nimbly, it becomes part of our culture. And I'm, I mean, I have to be super honest, I was very bad at it. And I don't know if Zach Conker is here. Um, <laughs> he's the head of our operations team. Oh my God, I think I was his, his worst nightmare, uh, let alone my boss and CEO, Jason, but he's a little more forgiving. Um, I just, I am very old school, right? Like I, I can't live without a notebook. I can't live, um, I am very good at taking notes. Just the commentation implies that it is available to everyone, not only you. And that is the part that kind of took a little time to, to digest in my brain. Like, hey, Lord and I, it's totally fine that you are documenting, but these notes need to be served for people to understand those insights. And I think that's another very important part, Brad, from what you were saying on, on how to uh, train your team to identify these skill gaps. I think a, a, a crucial part of this is Train your team also on being comfortable around finding those insights because a lot of the times we see that even the word insight is loaded and people don't really understand what it means. Like, what is an insight? What am I looking for in these systems? What am I looking for in these gaps? Um, and the answer is every single thing that it's not visible to you uh, at very first sight and probably it's, it's not even uh, uh, visible to your, co to your customer, um, that's an insight. So it's kind of the battle between explicit and inexplicit. Usually inexplicit things are amazing and absolutely good insights that are gonna allow, uh, allow you to make this documentation process a better experience for everyone. Uh, because the tools, I mean, it's a really nice era to live in. You have plenty of tools to choose where to document your stuff. Um, my personal process was I needed, I mean, I'm still <laughs> taking notes. I have my notebook here. I can show it, but <laughs> I, I don't want to because I don't know if someone is watching me. Uh, but uh, start changing the behavior and then change the mindset. So the first thing that I needed to do was, okay, I'll bring my computer. Uh, and I forced myself to do that. Soon enough, I found myself changing the mentality on, okay, again, this is not about selfish Lorena trying to understand the meeting. This is about the revenue team needing to come back to this information at some point. Yeah, you're spot on. I think the, the one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll kind of add a little bit of an anecdote to and, and don't beat yourself up, Lorena, because I wasn't that great at documentation either. Because I think, I think what we realize sometimes, we document what we find to be the important stuff, but sometimes we forget some of the little things. And, and we talk with our customers about this all the time. You know, walk me through one of the projects that you're working through right now. How are you documenting this? How are you setting yourself up for success and adoption? And the first thing out of their mouth is always, 
man, we've got this big project. We're overhauling our sales cycle. We're, we're implementing these new systems or new strategy. I was like, those are, those are all, again, very important things to document. Those are big projects. But let's don't forget about the little ones. Let's remember that what we might not consider a project, but when that, that VP of sales comes over and says, hey, we have a new competitor that just landed on our radar. We need to track that. Um, document those pieces. When you add that new person to that pick list value, as small as that is, all the way down to your systems, document that. Because if we're not, we're going to look up a year from now and say, when did we add those values? When did we start tracking that metric? When did we start winning against that person? So it's just so important to over document and just get everything in, in one spot. Absolutely. Great. All right, fun times. We keep with the fun. Hillary, what do we have this time? All right, here is the second poll. How often do you experience bottlenecks when working cross function func cross functionally? See, I can see that I can say that word uh, <laughs> uh, now. <laughs> At least I tried. How often do you meet with your whole revenue team now that we understood who is the revenue team? And what are your company's biggest gaps? That's a good one. I'm gonna I'm gonna be enjoying that answer. I don't know about you, Brad, but I think I'm gonna be very excited about that one. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Looks like we still have answers coming through. We'll give five more seconds. Fantastic. Oh, this is great. How often do you experience bottlenecks when working cross-functionally? I love the diversity here. Often it's sometimes, but the reality is no one's selected never. So at least we're <laughs> on, uh, on the same track there. But I think we're always going to define bottlenecks and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, you know, in the coming slides. But um, I think what we'll all realize is that we're, we're all going to be hitting bottlenecks. Hope, that's a good thing. I don't want to you know, gloss over that. The fact that we create a process on day one, we almost have an expectation that it might not work on day 90. So let's get rid of some of the bottlenecks that are part of it and continue to you know, modify. Uh, how often do you meet with your whole revenue team? Um, again, love seeing the diversity here. Here we do actually have almost 20% say never. Um, interesting, we'll definitely address that. I think you should at least be meeting with your revenue teams at some point on a either daily, weekly, or monthly basis. I think this one, you know, I don't, I don't want to push here that there's a wrong answer. I think a lot of this is driven on what your team's go-to-market strategy looks like, what your sales cycles look like, how often do you really need to be meeting. So um, I don't look at this as a, a, a binary, this is good or this is bad. I will be the billion then and then say there is a wrong answer. Never is never the good answer, people. You need to meet, <laughs> you need to communicate with you with your team. If you don't want to call it a meeting and that's kind of intimidating, fine. Call it a coffee break, call it um tequila session, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, but communicate with your people in some matter. Um almost 20% that that's very impressive to me. Very, very impressive. Absolutely. So, yes, it's time to start collaborating on shit. Um, <laughs> let's go to the next slide here, please. Um, so, yeah, he, here is what, what we are seeing. Breaking silos is such a deep topic to our hearts because, again, it's why Go Nimbly was born, right? Um, we've seen these probably in every single client that we have served until today. And we've been in the space since 2016 as a revenue operations con con um, company. Uh, before that, we were more like a Salesforce sales shop. Um, but the, the main thing is I want to talk to you about is why this happened, because I think that's where you need to start every single um, solution that you want to try. Ask why, why is this happening? Like, what are the causes? And I'm gonna help you a little bit and I'm gonna give you four of the main causes that we've seen uh, through our book of business. So the first one, it's good news. You are growing, you are a grown up. Your company <laughs> stopped being the two friends that had an idea and that came to Silicon Valley and like, that's a story, that's not your story anymore. You are really becoming an adult and that's a good thing but that's gonna organically create those silos that nobody likes. The second one, 
I'm not gonna plug it because I just don't feel like to, but uh, the, highest, the higher degrees of specialization that I was talking about. Um, I wanna recommend a book called T-shaped, um, actually, no, the name is Cat Monkeys and T-shaped People, something like that, look for it. It's a fantastic book that talks about this. Um, and the reason why we believe in generalists against, against specialists is simply because those are the teams that become more agile. And with the growth that you're experiencing, you're gonna need agile people that are equally comfortable managing the sales operations instance, but that they also know and, and know their stuff and are equally dangerous in the marketing upside um, or in the customer success side, um, it, it, it varies. Um, the other cause is more departments. Of course, you are growing. You don't. You 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 thought you were gonna scale just based on sales. Well, surprise! You need customer success, and probably you started with customer support. And uh, and uh, of course, you already brought marketing in because we are the ones that spend the money, and you need to spend the money. Yes, those more departments are gonna keep creating different uh, goals for each one of those departments. Again. Um, uh, moving into into silos and into having their own mini goals and then the last one is is kind of a tough one and i and i think i want to hear from you brad the incentive system historically as we know it sales and marketing for example they've never been incentivated the same way uh i am not proposing in this webinar like hey everyone go and put your marketing team on quotas I don't know if that if that's gonna work. I am still I, I am seeing teams that are starting to go towards that model uh, because the, the, the idea is that both uh, sales and marketing are looking at revenue and they are measured on on impact revenue or pipeline creation. And with that, then people feel like okay, if I am contribute contributing to the same metric, then I should be incentivated or compensate the same way. Um, what do you think about that, <laughs> Brad? You're, you're spot on. I think this kind of goes back to the, the the story we were telling about, you know, that, that dreaded boardroom story. It's like, well, we hit our goal. Well, your goals tracked a little differently the way I was even analyzing what I thought your goal was. And so, uh, you know, we, we see it more now with, you know, the shared number approach of, you know, we are a go-to-market team. We're in charge of revenue. Let's go set a goal for that revenue. Let's go get it. Uh, let's not worry about, well, we brought in X many dollars of uh, pipeline revenue from this vertical and then, oh, well, that all got, that wasn't really real revenue. We all know that guy, but let's just let's throw that away. None of that's doing any good for, you know, your own company, for our companies, for anything that we're going to help you support on. Because if, if we can't see how you are aligning all of your goals, uh, it's really tough for, for the sonars of the world, for the code influence of the world to help you achieve those goals and exceed them. So, um, that, that revenue alignment and the way that you go to push that, that goal is, is super important. I think, you know, to, to elaborate with what you were talking about on, and this is a great segue into, um, you know, sort of story time of breaking down silos. Um, you know, it's tough when you think of, well, I've got this one person who just supports uh, the sales side, or I've got this one group or this one person who just supports marketing or customer success. I think it's way more important to, you know, take that step back, find folks, you know, um, I'm very bullish on our friend Andy Hopkins over at, at Where to Go. Um, he's got some great stories about how you know, these silo departments just make it challenging to manage the tech stack across these teams. And I think when you you start to put you know, high expectations and, and very high outputs from folks like uh, Andy and, and all the other customers that are managing complex technology, managing high expectations from all these groups, one of the things that I know him and I have talked about personally is setting these uh, very clear and transparent expectations for what you're doing to support other parts of the business. Um, I, you're talking to, to the RevOps leaders all day, every day. That's my Lorena's job, best job in the world, if you ask me. And we hear some of these same uh, pain points. Like, man, I'm working on this really big project for, for marketing. And it's just, it, it's taking a lot of my time, my effort, my energy. Um, but that doesn't always translate all the way down to you know, the sales team or the customer success team because it's, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for them. Um, you know, they feel like I'm kind of falling behind because I'm not doing their stuff. So, you know, 
what that really evolves into is making sure that that alignment, be transparent. Like we can't say it enough, kind of like a pound your fist on the table, be transparent about what projects you're working on, why these things are important, how they drive the overall business goals, because you translate it that way and you go and talk to that person who's asking you another request, they're going to be very empathetic to you. Like, oh, that's right. You're working on that big marketing project. That's, that's just going to move the needle for us. My request can wait. So, um, yeah. And, and with that, I, I think people all, always love the, the concept of best practices or the top five uh, things to do in order to fix this problem. Um, and I think I'm going to talk about five specifically, but I, I do believe in what you were touching uh, before, Brad, which was communication, because this, is, this has to do with number one. Uh, weekly cross-functional <laughs> cross and uh, uh, meetings. Uh, so everyone that answered never, <laughs> just come to me. I'll give you the right pitch to, to get to your team and like start these meetings because you do need to, to communicate again. And one of the problems that I am personally seeing is that unfortunately, the more we evolve in business, I'm starting to see that we talk a lot more about each other than with each other. And that's a problem because that's a waste of time, not only for an individual, but for your company, for your growth, for, for the next stage of the, of, the, of the company that you wanna get to. And the next thing about these meetings, it's they have to be momentum based. Otherwise, nobody does anything. Um, third tip on meetings. If it's an update, you don't need a meeting. You won't ever need a meeting if you are coming to, to, the, to the meetings to just update your team on something. That's why beautiful companies like Slack were created. So remove those. These meetings need to, need to be action-based. So you need to get out of that room with some things that you need to work on. It can be big projects, it can be small projects, it can be medium, that doesn't really matter, but it needs to be action-based. Then the second thing, and going back to why we exist as the RevOps company is the customer, right? If you don't know every single motivation of your customer in every stage, we have a bigger problem. Um, and then you need to go straight to the source of information, which in this case is your customer. I encourage everyone to talk to your customers as often and as close as you can. If that's not possible, Try to see recordings of the meetings that are happening with them. Try to connect with them on LinkedIn. Try to find them at really weird happy hours that now are digital <laughs> and like whatever it is, but find them. Um, and then after you have that information, map, map your customer journey from end to end and have it very visible in, in, in a system. You can even have it like going back to a design thinking world. You can even have it like in the walls of your company that could actually make kind of a cool piece of art if you ask me. Um, third thing, build a strategic operational roadmap uh, because once you have the information of what's happening in that customer journal uh, journey, you need to be able to act on it. So this is where it comes um, to the technicalities of like, okay, now I have the information, where do I start? Build your roadmap, put your actions in, and then you're gonna be set for success. Four, pay attention to, to your data integrity and visibility. Data stewardship, it's not a culture thing because it was never, because, I mean, I'm sorry, data scientists, it was a boring job. And it was not very, very strategic until very recent years, where now people that hold the data and that knows what to do with that data are starting to be the decision makers. So pay attention to that. Make it part of your culture. If you are small, if you are a, a, ser a seed series, series A, start with the right foot. Um, clean those systems. Have a clear idea of what's in there. Have, a, have, a, have one person that determines what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, don't have everyone having opinions. Uh, I think it was the ex-CRO at um, HubSpot, Mark uh, Ruberge, which is someone that I deeply admire that said, um, if you put two people in a room, you're gonna end up with four opinions. Um, <laughs> yes, that's very true. You don't need several people to make decisions. You just need to, delegate to the right brain and the right mind 
to have this data integrity and, and make it uh, successful. And the last one, seek out perspectives from outside of your own function. Um, this one is important because it doesn't necessarily have to be in your industry. It can be something, something or someone that you know uh, are doing a great job and you, you, you know you want to kind of mirror those, um, um, those actions. Go and, and, and ask. You would be surprised how many times people are able to give you their time. So go and ask for, for a perspective because sometimes a mirror can be a little deceiving. Um, yes, so that's what I have on best practices. Yeah, you're spot on there. And I think uh, uh, that the last part, just to kind of index on that a little bit, that's why we're so excited about a lot of folks that are on this call with us today coming from all these different communities that, we, uh, that we're part of and ask questions, be curious, find out other perspectives because that's how you truly learn. So um, you kind of segue into a little bit of like, you know, we, we've talked about all the shit we need to know. How do we get leadership buy-in? Um, because I think we've all been through some of these uh, you know, projects and stories where we're doing something very important and, you know, it, we think it's going to go well and it doesn't. And I've got a little story or, or anecdote to that, but um, you know, the truth is that when teams are aligned, they generate 38% more revenue uh, and 27% less time. I mean, I think this is just, you know, down to the, down to the roots of what we're trying to discuss, what we're trying to get really better at ourselves every day is be more efficient, you know, generate more revenue and do it in less time. Um, but one of these things, when we talk about, uh, you know, executive alignment and getting buy-in from, uh, you know, all the way from the top and making sure that at this exact time that, you know, this is the right time to hit go on this project. Um, so, Funny story for me, when I was uh, at Gather, we were overhauling our entire sales process. And you know, one of the big projects I was working on and we spent months doing it. We had so many different things. And we were ready to present to the team uh, midweek sometime. And we were getting into the office. My presentation was at 10. I had a nice actual shirt on that day. I was feeling great about myself. What I didn't know was that the day before or that night of, we're actually going to move the desks around in the office. You know, shift things up a little bit. Marketing's going to sit over here now. Sales is going to be over there. And had I known that, I probably wouldn't have presented that after that time because I get into that meeting and I look at everybody around the room. They're all texting each other. And I hear people whispering, I can't believe I don't have my window seat anymore. And so when we talk about adoption of a new process of rolling things out is so important to make sure that everyone in the company is aligned so that we get the right attention for those folks. So, um, you know, a, a project can be great, an initiative can be great, but if it's not all aligned all the way through, it, it's not the best seat. So, um, yeah, when we talk about some of these best practices, you know, however, how do we really start to, uh, to understand, um, you know, establish these whys. I, I can't say it's enough. I've, I've talked to some of our customers about this too. Uh, when you're making changes, ask why five times. Um, ask it probably even more, but at least five. Why are we doing this? What cause is this actually going to, uh, what beneficial cause is this going to bring to the organization? Yeah, identify the who. Um, you know, if, if you're getting requests from uh, team members, but you know that they don't have their managers and their directors and their VPs and their executives on board with this, like, did we, who did we review this with? Did we get buy-in from everyone? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we talk about setting clear and honest expectations. RevOps is the busiest role in a company. I'm going to pound my fist on the table and say it over and over again because we have so much responsibility to do with making sure that uh, the lights are on, the wheels are spinning fast. If you are backlogged in projects, be honest. Great idea. Love what you're talking about. I can get to this next month. Um, and lastly, you know, with that story we're talking about driving adoption from the top down, you know, we want to make sure that you have executive alignment and executive buy-in all the way from the top. Um, so uh, we always just want to make sure that that's something we always get. Ooh, defining ROI, how do we actually measure that shit? So, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just read it because we love numbers and uh, serious decisions. It's 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 an organization that we truly uh, follow and believe in. So according to them, uh, B2B companies that are aligned on their RevOps strategy grow 12 to 15 times faster than their peers um, and are 34 more profitable. Why is this? Well, it's not a coincidence, right? Like if you start doing what Brad and I have been talking uh, about over the last 40 so minutes, 46 minutes, 
um, you're going to start to see your velocity rates um, get, getting getting higher. So you're gonna you're gonna see those change. Probably your conversion rates are gonna stay the same, or they are gonna go higher as well. So what is the result of that? Revenue. What is the result of revenue? Hopefully profit at some day, at some point. And that point is going to be where companies are going to stop to focus on just growth by the sake of growth. And they are going to start focusing more on profit. That's kind of the, the gold standard and what we want to, want to do. Uh, the other, the other way to measure these, um, or at least the way we do it at, at Go Nimbly is one of my favorites is around vanity metrics, right? You need to be mindful about them. Yes, they exist. Yes, they are a little pack on our backs, especially for marketers and to say like, hey, I'm doing something in the right direction or, or like people are starting to engage with us. Yes, pay attention to them. But what I'm gonna tell you right now is don't let them guide the ship. Because if you commit, commit that mistake, your entire organization is going to be looking at the wrong KPIs. And at the end, vanity metrics don't tell you anything. It doesn't mean anything that your top 20 tier one accounts are in your website. If they don't show, um, like if they show engagement, it's fantastic and you kind of start to move the needle a little bit. But that doesn't mean that you're going to come to your CEO saying like, hey, I have everyone on the website. Well, so what? That doesn't mean they are going to buy. Probably they need the information and it's a good thing, but that, that tells you nothing about the lifetime value that that account or future customer is going to give you. So that's on revenue on, on uh, vanity metrics. The other thing, define, and probably I should have started with this one. I am so sorry, people. Define what success looks like. Um, not everyone, not, not every company is the same. And this is a favorite answer of the entire SaaS industry. It depends. And this comes from the only Troy Conquer. Um, it depends. It depends on the organization that you have. But pay attention and try to be as holistic as you can, even if you are at a seed stage company or if you're an, an, an IPO. Uh, whatever that looks like, you need to be holistic and have that mind. It's, it's more like a mindset, but uh, okay. And then know your data, understand it, digest it, and then make decisions based on that. Uh, keep the momentum and then keep going, keep going one foot in front of the other towards those goals. And that's the way you, you pretty much measure um, revenue operations. I love that. I think one of the interesting things from, you know, from our perspective, especially what we're seeing uh, in your spas, know your data. You have to know exactly what this looks like. You have to know what story it's telling. Uh, but more importantly, define what success looks like for your company well before you uh, try to even boil it down to a number. We get asked this all the time. And it's a perfectly warranted question. All right, what's, what's the ROI on, on Sonar? And I think too often we start to push this dollar in, dollar out mentality for ROI. If I put a dollar in, how many dollars do I get out? Well, I think the bigger thing to think about that is let's measure what ROI of RevOps is to begin with. Do you see this? You're, you're paying attention to all of your revenue goals. You are the, the, the frontline leaders of making sure that your team does hit those revenue goals. Now, I hope I'm not spoiling anybody here on this, but not too many RevOps folks I know are actually closing deals or generating new leads. That's not necessarily part of uh, what you're actually doing on the RevOps side of things but you are making sure that the folks that are closing those deals are the wheel is spinning fast and, and we're keeping the, you know, the oil in the machine of making sure that it runs as quickly as possible with low friction. So that's what one of those ROIs is bringing in, you know, these RevOps groups and RevOps teams, making sure that everybody in this go-to-market strategy is set up for success and that they can truly make sure that we're going to hit and exceed our goals. Absolutely. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. This, this has been great. We did have a few questions actually that came in. So in the last couple of minutes, figured we could um, throw them your way and, and see if we can get them answered. Absolutely. Um, so first one is from Riley. How do you balance delegating work out to subordinates or other departments without losing the alignment that you were talking about? 
Ooh, 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 this is a people question, my favorites. Uh, I guess I, 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 can, I can take on that. I think delegating work, it's a scary. And I'm gonna acknowledge that right now with, with everyone. It is very scary because, especially when there's a new member in the team and when you're trying to, to coach someone, um, so how do you make sure to delegate while, while you're still aligned? For me, honestly, is it was getting to know the person to the human level. It sounds weird. It sounds like, like why should I do that if we're in a workspace, if we're in a work environment? The only way that you're going to build trust is by knowing that in the people and they're they're the same way that you're understanding your customer on the personal level and where are they going through right now through the pandemic, for example, is the exact right, uh, same way that you're going to manage your teams. If you understand why they are not being um, as specific as they were or why are not, they are not being as happy as they were or why they are being extremely excited about their, the job, find out why. Take the time. Go and talk to each other. Again, the thing that I said, let's just stop talking about other people in the organization and start talking to each other. That's a way that you're gonna build that trust and that's the only way to delegate. Otherwise, you, you're gonna constantly be thinking, oh my God, I shouldn't trust this person. I should have done it myself. And that's not the way you wanna run an organization or a team. Um, hope that answers your question. Riley okay. Humes. <laughs> Awesome. Um, thank you. So Jonathan has a question. How do you recommend segmenting your documentation in one larger document or smaller ones based on the update? Oh, love that. Well, the question, Jonathan, um, you know, I, I hate to be the cliche answer of it depends, but I really think um, I'll say this to start with. First off, whatever you're talking about with documentation also helps with uh, Riley's question for Briar. How do you make sure that you uh, get alignment on delegating? Let's document this properly. You know, set expectations like, hey, if I'm going to delegate this project or this one task to you, where are we keeping track of the success of that? Even if it's all the way down to a Google Sheet, you're just you know, typing, did I do this binary? Yes, no. Um, but Jonathan, to your point on, on tech, um, documentation, uh, this is tough. You know, Lorena and I both talked about earlier, we weren't the best at documentation. But I think the, the reality of whether it be one large document or one small document, I think it's probably more important to make sure that whatever you're documenting, whether it be in one Google Doc that links out to other ones or one very large index uh, thing like Guru or anything like that, we're not going to talk about other companies, but make sure that your go-to-market teams know where it is because you'll probably get more feedback from them on how you're documenting this, especially if it has something to do with the process they should follow. You'll quickly find if it's overwhelming to them that, wow, we put this huge index and glossary together via you know, Google Docs that is 95 pages long and I'm getting lost in the shuffle and even trying to find what I'm supposed to do with the next step. So I would very much say, uh, you know, keep it to where it's efficient for your team more than anything, but, uh, you know, make sure that people just know how to find what they're looking for, whether it be in one doc or many. Great. Um, I'll take Dina Barshavsky, yeah. if that's okay with you here. Go, go for it. Simply because I love your last name and I think I, I kind of nailed it. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I think you did. <laughs> I, if not, you can, you can text me and say like, you know what, Lorena, you, you absolutely messed it up. Any advice from a one person revenue operations team, current title sales says sales ops, but we really don't have anyone on the customer side except me. Ooh, eh, is it lonely there, Dina? Probably it is. But I have you good news. Uh, you are in this webinar. You seem to have the intention to have um, to understand that legacy operations need to disappear. So the good news is are because there, there, there are many. First of all, you have the right mentality. Uh, you have access to either Brad or, or, or myself to kind of ask for, for more deeper advice. Um, we are absolutely open to that. What I would say, go and find other champions. Why, what's the reason that motivated you to join this webinar? Probably there was someone else in your team that wanted to join and you didn't even know. Try to find those people and then little by little, you're gonna start to, to build that almost like a committee of people that are all gonna be uh, revenue operations leaders. 
it doesn't, it doesn't, please take that away from your mind. It doesn't have to do anything with the title. It can be sales ops, it can be sales dev, it can be sales, whatever it is. The main idea is that you want to become a revenue operations professional. So you're in the right path. Yeah, you're spot on. The, the one thing, and, and I can tell you, Dina, I would love to actually talk to you about it, but I'll tell you this. I battled that when I was in sales ops and I knew I was supporting customer success and with marketing. The one thing I would absolutely say is, sounds cliche, document it and build a story behind it because you're doing hopefully quarterly reviews with your company, your semi-annual annual reviews. Go about a month and document what tasks you're doing for each part of the business. Because if your title says sales ops, but you know you're spending 40% of your time with success, 25% with sales, another 25% with uh, marketing and 10% other, wherever the other uh, could be, build that pie chart and show it to your leadership. Like, here's what I'm supporting. Here's where I'm spending a lot of my time. Here's why it's going to be important for us to adopt a RevOps framework. Mm -hmm. Great. I know we have uh, two minutes and two more questions. Can you guys do it? We absolutely can. <laughs> uh, um, I can take another one and then you can, you can wrap, us, wrap us up, uh, Brad, if you don't mind. Perfect. Uh, Alexander Harris, um, I also like the name Alexander a lot. Um, what do you consider vanity metrics? What do you consider to be the most valuable metrics for sales and revenue ops teams? Okay, vanity metrics, super easy. Website traffic, that's a vanity metric. Every single thing that has to do with socials, likes, comments, shares, Every, if you think about social media, everything that is around it, it's a vanity metric. Um, um, uh, uh, content consumption. It's, a, it's kind of one of the big ones and it's a really important one, but it's a still a vanity metric. Again, if, if they, uh, well, okay, people, here's another, another advice. Stop getting content why you did it in the first place. Like, I, I, I don't get it. Like, Gonimbly has never, ever gated any piece of content because if you want to serve a really good customer experience, you don't need their emails. That Everyone knows that's a trap. So stop lying to your clients. Um, so anyways, that, that's me just being mad at people that still gate content. But uh, those are vanity metrics. Which ones are more important? Brad... It depends. <laughs> yeah. It depends. It depends on, on what stage and what type of growth you're looking for. If you're looking for, for revenue growth, probably, for example, as I said, content consumption is going to be a good one. If you're looking for company growth, so like headcount, um, you, are wanna, you, you will want to be looking for um, engagements in your, in your social platforms, or probably you're going to be wanting to look at Google, Google ads if you're using uh, any type of paid acquisition to see click to rates, for example, that's a really good one if you are planning to kind of grow your company, if you have a retention page or something, um, uh, or a recruitment channel, uh, you're, you are going to want to see those metrics. Again, keep an eye on them. Don't trust them. Don't trust them. They are not your friends, but they are your acquaintances. That's how I like to define them. Um, so yeah, last question, Brad. Yeah, uh, we'll get through it quick. Spencer, thanks for asking us. Uh, why doesn't the market seem to value RevOps, especially from a, a, a person perspective, a compensation resource and standpoint? Um, TLDR of that, I think the market's still figuring it out. We talked about it earlier, five years ago, we saw this surge of RevOps, but it was one person, 2020. Now we see RevOps and its teams and its consultants and its software. I think the market's truly still figuring it out. But one of the weirdest parts of it, to be real honest, and I ask this to every you know, customer we talk to, how did you get here? Because I find people that are getting into RevOps and they had a marketing background or they had a consulting background or they had a sales background. And I think what drives so much, especially on the compensation side, is, is where you've been and where you're going. And so because we have so many different backgrounds coming into this RevOps framework and people have, and I love it because it brings diversity, it brings two different ways of thinking, consultants are way different than uh, a sales rep that is converted from an SDR to AE to a RevOps manager. So I think that's why you're starting to see some of these levels of like, why doesn't the market necessarily uh, support it from a compensation standpoint? 
I truly think the market's still figuring it out. And that's what our jobs are from the Sonar side, from the Go Nimbly side, is to educate the market. Put on more webinars like this. Understand the importance. Understand why we have such a passion for, uh, for building these teams and building these programs out. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks, Brad. Um, to everyone that attended, thank you so much. We'll be following up with the presentation deck, a recording, and also a one-sheeter as a takeaway, non-gated, um, so you can yep. have it um, to enjoy. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again, Lorena. Thanks again, Hillary. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.